me on the slide, you're probably asking. Well, I'll tell you why. Because I was worried that I wasn't going to make it here. Um, <laughs> and I thought, if I don't make it, I would least like a virtual element of me to be here if someone else was to deliver my presentation. So you might say, well, why would you make it here? Well, this and that happens. Things happen. And as you know, flying um, from as far as the U.S. to London to catching planes and then here, I was just a little worried because it has happened in the past where I came in late or I didn't make it to the conference because of a backup in flights. And some of the flights have been backing up and canceling. So I thought, okay, I'll just put an image of myself there. So if someone else delivers my talk, you'll know what I look like. Um, it's a little bit embarrassing, so please forgive me for that, but that is the reason. Okay, so my talk is basically on transhumanism and why I think it is an important step to take at the juncture of looking at the future and future-proofing ourselves for the challenges ahead and how to adapt to these challenges as seamlessly, as smoothly, as um, possible. And that's always a challenge in and of itself. But if we exercise our abilities to accept change and the unknown, we'll be more affluent in it, we'll be more flexible, again, adaptable, and uh, scholars of change. And I think that that's what we really need more than anything. Many of you look like you probably have an athletic background like myself. I take a lot of pride in being an athlete, but I also consider being an athlete in my brain. I like to exercise my brain as much as possible by taking on new challenges. And um, I was asked by OC to tell you a little bit about my background, so I'll just shift to this, because you're probably wondering what I really do. Um, I started out as an explorer. As a child, I just wanted to discover the unknown. And I thought the only way to do that would to be an artist, because artists were given the freedom of expression. You can't censor an artist and the artist could do anything and call it art. So I became an artist. I didn't stay in that genre very long, but I did complete some accomplishments that I, I am very happy about. I went from being a painter and exhibiting in museums, and yes, my paintings have been in museums, and I've won awards with my physical image making, but I went from that into films because I wanted the image to come off the canvas, to say something, do something. So I became a filmmaker, and I was a filmmaker in residence at the University of Colorado in a Boulder, and my mentor was Stan Brackage. If you know the film industry or you know independent filmmaking, Stan Brackage is probably the most revered independent filmmaker. And I would go to his home up in the mountains, the Flat Irons of Colorado, and I would study film with him. And then I went from that into video because I realized film is chemistry, it's chemical, and you have to wear white gloves and be very, very careful with your film when you're editing. So I went into video. Video was the digitality of the image that jumped off the canvas. When we think of painting, which I still love as an art, we think of Jackson Pollock taking the paint off the canvas. And that's how I see longevity and transhumanism. Longevity is taking our lives outside the biological limitations of who we are and beyond the shelf life that we're given with the maximum lifespan of 122.3 odd years. And Jean uh, Calme was the oldest living person that we know of and we have not exceeded that lifespan. So why we are talking about anti-aging and longevity, we still haven't increased the maximum lifespan. So that's where transhumanism comes in. I wrote the Transhumanist Manifesto in 1983. Long before I met any other transhumanists, I was thinking about the idea of the transhuman. I had just been working in Japan and performing, and I was so busy with performing around the world, inside volcanoes, in the Atlantic Ocean, in the Amazon jungle, in the 1970s, before the industrialization of the Amazon jungle, I was there with the natives. 
I was inside a volcano that could have erupted. But these were my films because I loved the environment so much because of the sunrise, the clouds, the sunsets, the natural flow of the environment. But I've also seen the human body as an environment to explore. Inside the cells, the incredible makeup of all those little manufactured material that, are, that you can almost anthropomorphize. The workings of the body is incredible, but it's not enough. So I thought about what would it be like if I had a body, this vehicle, that could overcome disease. Now, most of us have had diseases to a mild extent and some of us to a greater extent. I made a shift in my life to get involved in longevity in 1980. It was a major shift for me. I was in a hospital in Japan and I was trying to get out of that darn hospital and I did escape. I snuck out and took a taxi back to my hotel. But I wanted to get out because I was told I might not live. And I said, the hell with that. I am going to live. So every night when my nurse would leave my room and the doctors were away, I would work on meditation and trying to heal my body through the will of determination. I snuck out of the hospital, bandaged up, and I was kicked out of the country. I was in Japan again, not well. The Beatles were in Japan at the same time in Tokyo and I was in um, Nagoya. They were, said, they were forced out of the country. Any entertainer or artist or performer in Japan was asked to leave. So I was escorted to the plane as I'm still bandaged up and not well. I left the country and I decided then no one was ever going to tell me that I couldn't do something that I really wanted to do. And I think Brenda would identify with this. Aubrey has already said this. And many of you feel that because you're here. And that is the root of the idea of philosophy to question existence. Why are we here? What makes us have this incredible determination and passion about life? When I left the art world, I went into the sciences, and I just sat at the back of the room at many conferences, the longevity conferences, the technology conferences, and I didn't know very many people, but I would just sit in the back of the room and listen. I thought the art world was great, and I still love it very much, but I didn't fit in anymore. So I started making my videos about identity and gender identity and identity about life and changing from male to female and changing the color of my skin and changing my circumstances. I won awards with my films. I've been exhibited in Moscow, exhibited at the Environmental Film Festival in the United States, and I won first place in Women in Video for my determination about identity. It is that determination that makes me want to continue who I am in living longer. I don't want to be remembered in my work like our famous friend who uh, was a filmmaker and Woody Allen is well known and there's some consequences about his creative endeavors and integrity, but he said it and he said it really well, but he wasn't the first. The idea about longevity as Jose Carrero uh, talked about is historical, going back to the Taoists, to the Egyptians, everywhere we've always tried to overcome this condition. So in order to take transhumanism in its seriousness as a philosophy, we needed to make it a movement. So I decided I wanted to make it a movement. Now I had to uh, really work hard at that. Um, first, I thought I'm going to get the words, I am transhumanism and I'm going to live longer. The idea of anti-aging longevity was first put out in the solar system on the Cassini-Huggins spacecraft in the late 19... What? I can't remember the year it went out. Anyway, um, it was my manifesto that was put on that spacecraft on the uh, CD disc. And that's kind of wonderful to have those words get out there in space. Never publicized it, never really talked about it because I wasn't into the being an influencer or doing the social media. We didn't have the internet back then. Taking our ideas out into space is one thing. Taking our ideas in the inner space is something else. We need to work on our own self-esteem and sense of identity and practice our goals 
and see the ambition in the humility of our own moral compass and a larger scene of ethics which lies in the field of law. If we future-proof our lives, we will be able to adapt to the challenges, whether it's facing words like aging is a disease, when people are suffering to get food, or if we're looking at the ideas of building technology that will help create a future where we will have equity. That is core. Aubrey mentioned this in his talk when he said that the, you know, some of the issues are about the haves and the have-nots, or the elite are going to get the first. I'm asked that in every interview I do. I'm asked that continually, and I've been asked that same question for 40 years. A little bit tiresome. I have never considered myself elite, but I have considered myself fortunate. But I didn't work easily to get there. I had to deal with being a woman in a man's world, and I still have to deal with that on a daily basis, as some of us talked about yesterday. So, in order to prove our life, to be more agile, to be more intelligent, to be more flexible, we need to understand learning. I'm an academic, I'm an educator, and I take a lot of interest in lifelong learning, especially e-learning outside the brick and mortar of universities, into everyday learning. YouTube is a great vehicle for learning. You want to know something, you go to YouTube, you can figure out how to fix your front door. I do it on a daily basis. Anything I need to do in my garden or any construction around the house, I go to YouTube. It's easy. We have to keep on learning, and it's okay not to know something. It's better to say, I don't know, can you tell me, can you show me, can you explain to me, than to act like you know it all. It's better not to do that. It's also better to say, I'm wrong, I made a mistake. I did it. And I'm usually the first one to put up my hand and say, I did it, you know, I apologize. Because it feels so good to wash ourselves of that. And I think these are some of the core elements of transhumanism. Remember, transhumanism is humanism, meaning, Humanity has a goal. If we are the so-called most intelligent species on the planet, which we've told ourselves numerous times, I don't know if that's true or not, but if we are, then we have a responsibility to have some dignity and to be more humane and more generous and share our knowledge rather than to uh, compete and let our egos get in the way of who we are. To question continually, to mind shift, and understand the position of someone else is a real skill. Again, being an athlete, not only in our bodies, but in our brains, is so essential. To understand, to have compassion, to create, to share, rethink, and impact. So what are all these? These are all part of innovation. If you're an entrepreneur, and you're doing a pitch deck, or you're pitching your concept, you start with learning what it is, questioning yourself, mind shifting to understand your audience. Then you create your minimum viable product and then you share it. You rethink it because you've gotten some feedback that may not make you feel so good, but you're told you could do it better this way or this way. And then you reiterate and reiterate and reiterate and then you impact. The future proof of the environment is so essential. I get the criticism, well, transhumanism, you don't care about the environment. You're so human-centric. You're just all about yourselves. You don't care about other animal life forms. You don't care about the environment. It's all about humans living forever and taking control of the world. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reason I told you about my background many years ago, when uh, many decades ago, uh, 50 years ago, I guess maybe 60 years ago, I, I guess 50 years ago I was an artist, 40 years ago, so um, my work was in the environment because I cared about it. That's why I went to the Amazon jungle. That's why I went inside a volcano. That's why I joined the merchant marines to sail out at the sea to see the world. That's why my manifesto got on board the Cassini Huggins spacecraft because I cared about the earth. And one of the most beautiful concepts about the earth was made by Carl Sagan 
when he um, mentioned the speck of dust in our solar system, looking way back from a, a spacecraft. And he said, just think, every human that was ever born, ever lived, every idea, every breakthrough, every scientific, technological, any invention was created on that speck of dust. And here we are in that speck of dust. And here we are with wars and fighting and suffering. People not having enough food, enough clothes. Russia invading the Ukraine. Wars, stupidity, competition in ways that are not very nice. So we need to think about that, but also understand if we spend too much time becoming overly environmentalists and becoming overly concerned about global warming, we're going to miss the point. We do not know if humans created global warming. We're told we did it. That's kind of egocentric, don't you think? I mean, the Earth is a living body. It stretches, it yawns, we have continental drift, we have earthquakes, we have storms. Mother Nature can be a little bit of a bitch at times and cause us a lot of grief. The Earth is evolving too. So we have to adapt, and the more agile we become, not only in the conflicts in, amongst people, amongst countries, amongst beliefs, we also have to adapt with the Earth's changes. And we need to have clean energy, of course, and be more compassionate about other life forms on the planet. But let's not say that humanity or humanism or transhumanism or even posthumanism is only about the human, it's about the ecology of life. Lynn Margulies, Dr. Lynn Margulies, really influenced my dissertation. My PhD is on life expansion, about the technology and some of the biomedical interventions of longevity. During that time, I wanted to know what is life? Well, I mean, we talk about life extension, but what is life? Lynn Margulies wrote a book called What is Life? And she talks about how life is created in a cesspool of chemical stuff, kind of messy, messy stuff, and we evolve from that. But it's beautiful to consider that we are all part of the microorganisms. The other issue here is that we did not evolve as one species, as Dr. Aubrey de Grey said, mitochondria. We evolved with mitochondria. It is our ATP. It is our energy. We would not be here without mitochondria. Mitochondria is in our bodies. It doesn't share the same DNA as us. It is a different life form in our bodies that we synthesize with. In the future, we'll be synthesizing with nanorobots. So if we use the analogy of mitochondria, it helps people understand nanorobots going into the body and help repair, rejuvenate certain cells. The book that I have and I brought, and it's a gift for OC because he wanted it so much, is a simple little book. It says it all here. I wrote this because I was really tired of my students at university saying, well, what is transhumanism? I read that it is atheist. I read that it is all about humans. I read that it wants to take over the world and force people to you know, join its group. I said, what are you talking about? Nothing could be further from the truth. Then there are the journalists who use hyperbole to talk about transhumanism. And then it's often um, said that, um, <laughs> no matter where the conference is, it's said that it lists men. It's either this man or that man, or Ray Kurzweil, or Nick Bostrom, or um, the battery's low, you might need to charge it. Do you want to put charge in the battery? Let's oh, see, charge. Um, no, that is absolutely, unequivocally not true. So I got fed up with answering the question, what is transhumanism? And I had to say, the reason why people always mention the most quote-unquote famous men is because they were written by someone else. I was here first, and I'm going to claim that because I'm a little bit tired of being overlooked when it comes to transhumanism. Thank you. successful businesses in a very interesting and beautiful ski resort, and I went and I worked as a waitress, I worked as a secretary, I stopped everything, I didn't tell anyone who I was, and I learned and I studied and I got the movement going. 
So why do we need a movement? Why are movements important? Because they help us get up out of our chairs and have that passion about life. Even longevity is a movement. Environmentalism is a movement. Apartheid was a movement, still is. Anti-discrimination, anti-bias, these are movements that we need to shift uh, people's thinking about who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. The reason why I love transhumanism is because I grew up in the 1950s and I had to deal with overcoming all the discrimination against me, not only as a woman, but as an artist, and then as a transhumanist. And even after I got my PhD, I had colleagues ask me, well, where'd you get your PhD? I got it at the top school in the world for my field. Okay, so when I write an article, well, that's not good enough. It's always this, and many of us face this in our field, so I understand what it's like. Transhumanism is not about Ray Kurzweil. It's not about Peter Demandis. It is not about any one person. It's about the passion to overcome the human condition. So the next question is, what is the human condition? The human condition means that we are homo sapiens sapiens. We are animals, we're mammals. We have a biological clock. We have limitations put on us based on our genetics. So you might say, hmm, Richard Dawkins, that's interesting. Is that, have you all read Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene? If not, it's, it's really a good read. It talks about how we are the host for the carriers, the vehicles for our genes just to reproduce. But that has been a belief system of most cultures around the world. You reproduce, you get married, you reproduce, <laughs> vice versa. And then you grow old and you die. And then you get kicked to the curb. Old people used to be wise. And when you had white hair, you were considered old. And your time's up. Say a few wise things, be good to the grandchildren, a little bit of wisdom here and there, and then you die. That is so sad. That's part of the human condition. The human condition is not just about our biology and our shelf life, that we're only given a few years to live. But most of those years that we live, we live sick. We live struggling with disease, not only for ourselves, but for our loved ones, our parents, our children, our friends. Not only that, the disease, but emotional disease. Always comforting people who have broken up in a relationship, or going through traumas, or have mental illnesses, or maybe drug addictions, alcoholism, deep, deep sadness. Our lives are usually spent in zones of disease. Yes. No, let's take me off the screen then, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm here in person. We don't need to see that. <laughs> we don't want that. Now, I'm not someone who sports the hedonistic imperative. I don't think happiness is the answer. I think peace of mind is the answer. So if we can get to that point of peace of mind, and no matter what we do, and Gurdjieff said it beautifully with Ospensky when he said, if you can reach your level of peace of mind and treat the, the person sweeping the street on the same level as the wealthiest person or the king and queen, then you have come to a point of humility. And I think that's something transhumanism also represents. That it doesn't matter where you come from, if you're on the path, if you're on the way to enriching your lives, finding out where your core is, your identity, you will not have those things of jealousy or envy. You won't want to kick someone else out of the room because you want to be heard or you want to be seen. When you will credit other people that came before you for their ideas with joy, and when someone doesn't credit you, you'll stand up and say, excuse me, and speak up. Okay, Humanity Plus. I'm the executive director of Humanity Plus, but Humanity Plus, it's a great organization. It's the world's largest transhumanist organization, and we do a fair amount of work in Africa, and I'll explain that to you uh, briefly. Some of the milestones that we've achieved. Now, mind you, 
Transhumanism is one philosophy. There's not many different transhumanisms. There's one transhumanism. There are many different flavors or types of people within transhumanism because we're not um, a type of one size fits all. It's welcoming and accepting of people who want to improve their lives, maybe live longer, that's a core goal, but also learn to find out who they are, what they're doing, and how to achieve, um, innovate, achieve, and be the entrepreneurs of their own lives. Um, in um, some of the goals or the milestones of Humanity Plus, just as a little bit of history, Humanity Plus was incorporated in 2012. It was around since the early 2000s as a different name called the World Transhumanist Association. Uh, it changed to Humanity Plus because it got too political. People didn't like that. So we were very careful to stay away from right, left, uh, you know, different political beliefs. Anyone is accepted as long as you have the level of ethics that are, are necessary. Um, but the first transhumanist organization was called Extropy Institute. And I think this is really important when we're talking about the future of science and technology because many of the ideas that are espoused today stem out of Extropy Institute or transhumanism. Early transhumanists, Ralph Merkel, created the Merkel tree. The Merkel tree is a model for blockchain. How cool is that? He did it in the 1980s. Today, blockchain is very popular. Well, isn't it interesting that comes out of transhumanism? Very cool. Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is something most people know about, deal with, are interested in. Hmm, Hal Finney. Hal Finney was a member of Extropy Institute and a transhumanist. He is the second person to use Bitcoin. He was thought of being the founder of Bitcoin, but he was not the founder. He was the first, well, beside the founder, to invest in Bitcoin. How cool is that? Nanotechnology. We don't have nanotechnology yet today, but it's around the corner. The future of nanotechnology is molecular manufacturing, which will change the face of the earth. For example, you need to clean up something, send out the molecular nanorobots to do it. You have pollution, clean it up. You need a bridge, build it. You disseminate the bridge, you need a building, you build it. Does that make sense? It means that everything is looked at on the molecular scale, that all matter is comprised of the same stuff. It's just combined differently, okay? So if you need a house, you have the house. No longer need the house, you disseminate the house, you need a bridge or a road, you take that material and you build the bridge or the road. So waste is no longer an issue like it is today. We'll be able to recycle, reuse everything through molecular manufacturing, which is the future of nanomedicine, according to Eric Drexler. Eric Drexler was a member of Extra P Institute. Eric Drexler is a transhumanist. So then you talk about, well, nanorobots. What drives nanorobots? Artificial intelligence, AI. Well, narrow AI is what we have in machine learning, and it's advancing. Eventually, we'll have artificial general intelligence or super intelligence. Let's go, hmm, interesting. AI is everywhere. It's in our refrigerators, in our cars. AI is all around us. Well, the father, so-called, of AI, is Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky was a member of Extra P Institute. Marvin Minsky is a transhumanist. So this is why transhumanism is so important at its very historical core. The ideas that we're using today that have become mainstream, AI, nanotechnology, um, taking a look at blockchain, encryption, Encryption comes out of a very small group of people. Mark Miller, Ralph Merkel, list goes on.
that were all members of Extropy Institute. Back in the early 90s, we talked about all of this. And it was so great. So one day, th these ideas will become mainstream. They're here, they're mainstream. So is transhumanism needed anymore since all the ideas that we talked about in the early 1990s are here? Yes, it's more important than ever for the very reasons I started with. We need to be more flexible, more adaptable in our thinking because the changes and challenges ahead of us are going to hit us smack on. They're already hitting us. COVID. Were we prepared for COVID? No. But were there documentaries made about COVID? Yes. Who made those documentaries? Well, just consider. Bill Gates made a documentary about what would happen if we have a pandemic. How many years ago was that? Does anyone know? Several years ago. You can find it on Netflix. And then we had COVID. So we were not prepared. And no one knew. I think the important thing that came out of COVID was the realization of the vulnerability of the human body. We are so vulnerable, anything could happen at any time. And while a plan A could be to eat healthy, to exercise, to have your blood work done, know your biomarkers, do everything you can to stay as healthy as possible for as long as possible, something could happen. So cryonics is a pretty good backup plan. And I think it is plan A, as I was, <laughs> as Jose said. So the milestones for Humanity Plus. That is a little background. I just wanted to share that with you so you could see the importance of idea making. Innovation is in our brains, in our minds, in our imagination, in our creativity, in our ability to have the freedom to think, to even make our voices heard about something that other people say, that's stupid or that's silly, it'll never happen. Well, yes, it probably will happen. So this little book here, um, I'll get to it in just a moment. I don't want to go over my time. But I want to tell you something about Humanity Plus and why I think it's important, why I would love everyone to join. It's, uh, we have, um, we give out free membership if you really need it. But we also need money because we give grants, we give donations, and I'll explain that in just a moment. It's $60 a year. It's nothing. $60 a year, American dollars. I don't know what that is in African currency. But if you want to join like Foresight Institute, which borrowed many ideas from XTP Institute, you have to pay $350 a year, and you still aren't considered in the in crowd. We don't discriminate like that. We want to educate. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our goal is to educate. And that's why I love it. And uh, we have several different projects that are educational to help. We have our monthly uh, H plus roundtable where we have discussions and debates on longevity, on virtual worlds, on encryption, on I, no, everything that I've already mentioned. We have a weekly studies group that I run. Um, some of you do attend it. It is called the um, Transhumanist Studies Group. It's out of the uh, uh, Center for Transhumanist Studies. I wrote all the curriculum. It's only $25 to take that course, and it is pretty heady. It has everything, and it's exceedingly objective. I learned objectivity from being a university professor. You have to leave yourself outside the door when you go in and teach, and most of you are educators, so you know that. Um, so the course is really good, and then I have longevity studies, which takes a look at some of the facts that are out there and discerns those facts from marketing BS. And a lot of conferences on longevity have trade shows and their marketing products. Be very careful. There is no nanotechnology in these products, and nanomedicine is not here yet. Further, there is no stem cells in your toothpaste. So if you find someone who's selling you toothpaste at a trade show that says, oh, it has stem cells in it, it's going to revive your teeth, no, um, not so. So you have to be very, very careful about what longevity information you're getting and where you're getting it from. In Africa, now getting to the core of this, we have several projects that we're working on. One uh, that we've been doing for years, I think probably for three or four years, maybe even five years, is um, girls can code. 
and it was out of uh, Ethiopia, and it was teaching girls how to code so they can get jobs. So we've supported that for a number of years. The founder of that, Bethany, you know, let's just call her Betty, that's how she likes to be called, she is now working with, she's changed it from Girls Can Code, which would travel around Ethiopia, Ethiopia teaching coding, it's now called DigiTruck. And DigiTruck is bringing electricity and coding skills to remote areas of Ethiopia. And I just talked to Betty last week and we're trying to get her a grant to build that out. Uh, Nigeria, we have a couple of colleagues in Nigeria. I'll be working with them in bringing transhumanism and transhumanist studies into university formats in Nigeria and South Africa. If any of you are academics here at universities, I will share that curriculum with you. Again, it was not something for me to make money from. It is um, something I want to share because I have the information. And I have an incredible library of information from the 1980s forward on transhuman ideas that, again, include the sciences and technologies. One thing I left out when I talked about early transhumanism was um, stem cells and uh, genetic engineering. Uh, stem cells, Michael West spoke at one of our conferences years ago on stem cells, embryonic stem cells, and the other one is Greg, Gregory Stock. Both are, um, uh, is Michael West a medical doctor or a PhD? Yes, no. Okay, and uh, Greg Fay, uh, PhD, uh, I mean, uh, Greg Stock. Uh, really remarkable thinkers, Gregory Stock put on one of the first conferences at UCLA many years ago on gene therapies and taking a look at DNA and what we could do with DNA, both transhumanists and members of earlier Exotry Institute. Uh, so Humanity Plus is the evolution of Exotry Institute. We closed it down because we went bankrupt. Um, so that was kind of sad, but we were ahead of our time, so you have to be very careful in that. The other projects that Humanity Plus is doing is to not only bring information, knowledge, but to bring debates and discussions. We love to debate. And I, I really enjoy it when Chuck Wu comes after me and says, no, wait, Natasha, we need to talk about it this way or that way. It's really quite wonderful. And we have people from all over the world, Japan, South America, Central America, um, uh, even um, Saudi Arabia, France, etc. Every, uh, it's just, it's really a wonderful uh, session that's every Friday. Again, it's free, it's on Zoom. So the milestones that Humanity Plus has accomplished, um, this is not working now, okay. Okay, um, are really great. And I think it's wonderful that we have a transhumanist organization that is doing this, that has a background. It's not a new transhumanist organization that is pushing any agenda, like a political agenda or a personal, you know, all about me agenda. Humanity Plus is about everyone. It's about you, it's about the world, it's about the ecology of thinking and learning. Our core focus is longevity. Bottom line, transhumanism came about because of the idea of the human condition based on biology and a limited lifespan, okay? So all the other technologies that I just mentioned, AI, nanotechnology, encryption, blockchain, etc stem from the idea of longevity and how could those technologies help with longevity and other speakers have talked about that. Virtual worlds is another area that we've been at the very core center of with Philip van Niederveld um, since early, early days and of course space exploration. I did the pre-astronauts training in the 1980s and that was at the United States State Space and Rocket Center because I really want to go out to space. I didn't get to go but my manifesto did go. So this all comes out of transhumanism. So what is transhumanism? It's about a transition, a transformation from being a biological animal with limited expectations to overcoming the odds, not only in our bodies, but also in our minds. And here is the core of my talk, which I'm ending with. Ethics is an area that is often run by bioethicists, whether they're bioethicists or machine ethicists, they have a very loud voice. I don't know where they stand in South Africa, but if you haven't had the onslaught of bioethicists yet or machine ethicists, you will very soon, 
because it's a field that a lot of academics and uh, political legislation policymakers latch onto because they can get their name out there by being against something. So you have to be very articulate when you argue with them because they will try to nail you and, and categorize you that may not fit. So what's the answer? Empathy. I think fairness is one of the most important things that we should all be reaching for. We need to think about fairness and transhumanism has really tried its best to show fairness in giving credit to people who deserve credit by being fair and making, there's no leader of transhumanism, there's no guru, there's no uh, person who is the consequential transhumanist. It's all about us getting to the next stage in our evolution. The, um, without the level of fairness and empathy, we can't have the innovations and the entrepreneurship that we need. And we had a talk on entrepreneurship. And it was very well stated about the psychology of the entrepreneur. But if you don't know who your user is, you're not going to be a good entrepreneur. If you don't know who your audience is, you're not going to be a good speaker. If you don't know who your students are, you're not going to be a good teacher. So what makes us know who each other are? If we're here, it's because we have an interest in something that's tickling us, that we want to learn about. Whether you're here because of one of the speakers or many of the speakers or because you really want to see South Africa have a name for itself in the global world, I have to tell you, it already does. When I think of South Africa, I'm impressed by the level of accomplishments you all have made getting past some of the downfalls of human behavior <coughs> that is ingrained in our psyche. And we ought not to blame, oh, I want to just end on this, uh, we ought not to blame those who came before us, who restricted us, who told us we can't do it, or made us less than them, or didn't credit us for our accomplishments. We have to go, I understand. That's where they are, but this is where I am. Face it head on with kindness and understanding, but be firm. Don't let anyone get away with making you feel bad for the work that you've done. Stand up for yourself. Again, don't get angry, don't get mad, but put your foot down and say, no, that's, that's, no, you got it wrong. Someone said something to me the other day at the airport. I was trying to get on the plane, I'm glad that I could make it, and um, I was cold because the air conditioning was really bad and I had my, take my coat and my sweater off, put it in my suitcase. And she was fully dressed and she was a little bit taller than me, I'm only 5'3". Um, and she said, oh, you need to put, must, you need to put, um, what is it, fat on your skin or meat on you, you need to put meat on your body. And I said, no, I, I gave it a B and I remember hearing this for years and I said, no, I don't, I'm fine. I'm good the way I am. I'm not cool because I don't have meat on my body. When we judge people, how we look, how they, we think they look, that is not transhumanist. Remember, transhumanism is about understanding and accepting. We're all evolving. We're all trying to become better people, more mindful, more empathic, fair, understanding. And we need to help each other remind us to be kinder people. Okay, here's an analogy, and I'm going to end with this because I love this analogy. When we talk about life extension and transhumanism, people usually go, oh, they're nuts. They don't know what they're talking about. It's gotten better over the years, but I've been in this for 40 years. And I've been through the trenches, and I've been humiliated, and I've been applauded. So it's all okay. But it's interesting to me that when we talk about genetic engineering and tweaking our genes that mutate, the ones that get a little bit tired or weak or get infected, well, let's get rid of them. Let's revive them. Let's turn them around. And people will 
people say, oh no, designer babies, you're going to choose your genes, you're going to make designer babies, and you're going to play God. Is that playing God, really? It's being smart, it's being understanding, it's being kind, it's being empathic. You don't want to have a disease that's going to cause you pain and injury and suffering if you only have this limited lifespan. In 1978, the first test tube baby was born, okay? When that baby was born, by test tube baby, I mean the baby, the, the embryo and the sperm, the egg and the sperm were put in a Petri dish, the embryo was made, the Petri dish was uh, injected into a needle or syringe that was put into the woman's uh, uterus, a baby was born, okay? So if you don't know about it, it's a, it's a big marker in the field of biomedical intervention, probably one of the biggest markers. When that baby was born in the UK, the headlines across newspapers said, this uh, non-human baby was born. Uh, this is immoral. It's unethical. Who's she going to be? She's not human. She's something other. Today, more than five million people among us, walking down the streets, sitting here and there, maybe some of you were conceived in a Petri dish. So you take that span from 1978, where it's immoral, unethical, inhumane, the Catholic Church, the Pope came out and said this is a disgrace to humanity. And probably if Leon Cass and Francis Fukuyama were around at that time, they would have said it's missing the that, um, essence of being human. We're going to see great advances in biomedical interventions with human enhancement, with genetic engineering, with nanomedicine especially. And we need to stand by it and let them say what they say. And don't let them discourage us. And I think that many of the speakers on this matter have already mentioned this, to just see beyond it, to keep on going forward. I know I have, and I think it's something that we need. In this level of transhumanism is more about the culture, the attitude, the behavior, the acceptance, the love of life. It's as simple as that. Why die if we love life so much? Why be sick and injured if we love life so much? Let's make it better for all of us. Thank you so much. Love.